I feel like it's important for people to have worked through a financial plan and to have talked to somebody about all of these moving pieces of your life and how they all fit together. Yeah. Let's talk about a comprehensive plan, including, you know, what you're doing now, what you want to do in the future. And your investments is just a piece of that. Hey there guys, Dominique Henderson, your CFP on YouTube, bringing you another conversation in finance. This time I had the pleasure of a virtual sit down with Miss Jacqueline Shattuck, who is a CFP that I met through the Quad A organization. And um, you can learn more about Quad A. Maybe I'll link that down in the show notes. That's a Google homework item for you to do later. But we talked about so many different things and we got to um, always, as I like to start, with her money story and such a personal money story in her particular case. Um, here's what she had to say. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually um, a really crazy, very personal story. So for me, um, my journey down financial services started with watching my family go through their own personal struggle. Mm. So um, pretty much what happened was my parents inherited um, a little over a million dollars. Um, and due to lack of financial literacy and some really, really poor financial guidance from an advisor, they lost all that money in just a few years. Ouch. Yeah. So then I, um, you know, just kind of picked up and looked around and said, hey, there's got to be somebody out here who knows about investing and who understands how to, you know, build credit and how to save for retirement and how to get health insurance, um, all those things. And so I, you know, started and I was in school, I was in college at the time um, on a basketball scholarship. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to take this route. I looked for the CFP. That's what I came up with. And I decided, hey, certified financial planner, that's what I'm going to do. When you own property, it's different from having actual assets, liquid assets. So when you own property, you know, we lived on a thousand acres, but, you know, especially being younger, you don't actually understand what exactly it is that you have. Um, even my mother and my aunt, they didn't realize what exactly they had. So it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a different kind of wealth. Mm. So I um, actually grew up in a single parent household. My mother worked, you know, 60 hours a week, kind of just trying to make ends meet, um, which I know sounds crazy because it's like, what? She, you know, got all this money, but, you know, it doesn't happen to just fall in everyone's lap, right? So, you know, she worked hard, single mom. Um, you know, there wasn't really any talks about money except for a lack of. Mm. So when she inherited this money, she thought, oh, you know, there's an advisor guy that, that, you know, I went to high school with and he seems to be doing okay. So I'll go talk to him, which is actually a really good start. Right. But what she didn't realize was that in our industry, there's different kinds of advisors. And so she ended up with the kind of advisor that just wanted to put her into a couple mutual funds inside of some 529s. He didn't do any comprehensive planning for her. He didn't say, hey, you actually don't have enough to be the mother of five children and retire right now. You, you didn't actually get that much money. Um, he didn't say like, hey, you and your kids don't have any health insurance. You might need to get health insurance. He said, hey, we're in California. You want some 529 funds? Cool. I'll pretty much just sell you some 529 funds. And then um, you want to buy real estate? in Georgia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good time. It's two, it's late 2007. It's a great time to just buy some real estate. So yeah, wow. buy some houses. Mm -hmm. So wow. yeah, part, part of it's bad timing, but um, yeah, a lot of it was just, you know, my mom really, she, she tried the best that she could, but just ended up getting the short end of the deal, unfortunately. When I looked at a lot of things um, as an undergrad student in finance, you know, studying finance everything is about numbers it's all about just how numbers work but i knew after going through a situation of such a devastating loss that it was about more than just numbers yeah 
it's about a lot of things. It's about behavioral traits and it's a lot about emotions. There's so many emotions wrapped up in money that people don't even realize. So when I started to research what the CFP was gonna be like, what all it would entail, I realized that it was gonna be a really good fit for me because I feel like it's important for people to have worked through a financial plan and to have talked to somebody about all of these moving pieces of your life and how they all fit together. Yeah. Let's talk about a comprehensive plan, including, you know, what you're doing now, what you want to do in the future. And your investments is just a piece of that. So for me, I really approach it. I really approach investment management from a financial planning lens. And I think that's really important if you want to have a healthy financial life. Recent statistics would show that less than 3% um, of CFPs are people of color. And I was curious to see what Jacqueline's perspective was on being a female of color in this industry. And this is what she had to say about that. I used to answer this question and let me digress for a second. One of the Mm -hmm. things that I really want to stress to any young women that are looking at getting into the industry is as hard as it may be, you really have to stick to your story and stick to who you are, no matter what. Of course, you need to be a professional and you need to be competent, but that doesn't mean that you need to change yourself. Mm. And I always felt like my story as a double minority needed to fit everyone else's story. Mm. But the truth is, my story is very, very different. It's very different. Um, I guess, I don't know if we're calling people like triple minorities, <laughs> but like my, my situation is very different. So my mother's white, my father's black and Puerto Rican. Um, I didn't grow up with my father. So I only grew up with the white parents that I had. So... For me, when we talk about being like a double minority, I mean, it was even more of a shock to me getting into the industry than it was, you know, just day to day. Mm. Um, How so? Because, you know, when you grow up and you're essentially the only black kid, it's like, okay, people will pick on you. They might call you names. You're maybe weird when you get into your career and you are trying to make something of yourself and you have goals and that becomes a hindrance on you, it's, Mm. it's a very different feeling. Yeah. It's different. Um, as an adult, it, it really, it it can weigh on you for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So what, um, what have you used to kind of cope with that? Because I, I feel the same way, right? I feel that, um, and just my own little personal story is that, you know, I had a really, really, really sought after great job coming out of college. I got hired by a hedge fund, which you just don't hear. Um, and you definitely don't hear about African-American males getting hired from HBCUs, uh, doing those type of jobs. So, um, although I grew up with a very diverse background because my dad was in the military and we moved every three years. Um, it's still interesting as an adult male um, in this industry, right? And so I think that some of those same challenges cross gender, um, but at the same time, I'm curious of what you say to yourself. Obviously, I follow a little bit of your Instagram, so I know that you've got some really, really good brain food and um, internal motivation, but talk about some of the maybe strategies that you've used to cope um, with that dynamic um, as, it, as it is right now. Yeah, so um, funny, funny, quick digression. My grandmother is old school, white, Southern, from Louisiana. <laughs> okay. And um, as I was, you know, getting, I was excited. I was in college and I was like, hey, I changed my major from marketing, actually, to finance. I think I'm going to do great at this. I'm going to blow it out of the water. I don't care what anybody says. My grandma says, uh, are you sure you want to be a black woman getting into financial services? <laughs> Keep it real. I love it. I was like, yeah, it'll be fine. <laughs> um, 
But I actually lucked up and I got a really, really great first internship in college. Um, I interned with a black RIA in Atlanta and uh, he was awesome. He really took me in as more of like a mentee mm-hmm. uh, than an actual intern. And that was amazing. Like that's something that you always get. Uh, but I really do stress to people that if you can try to find a mentor, do so. I know FPA has a like formal kind of informal mentoring system that you can use. Um, so does the CFP board. So I really, really encourage people to do that. But for me, that person that took me in as a mentee, I can give you a, a quick story. Mm-hmm. You know, he was like, okay, trying to get you up to speed. I know you want to own your own practice one day, possibly. And I'm just going to do the best that I can to help you. Just a very, very selfless person. And so here I am, 20 years old. And he's like, okay, I'm supposed to go to this like wholesaling fancy steakhouse dinner thing, right? But he's like, no, I'm, I'm going to send you instead. Actually, I can't make it. So I need you to go for me. Yeah, I, I like am. the way that I like where this story is headed. <laughs> Drink it, right? <laughs> so I go to this fancy steakhouse dinner where you know you get wine tickets and all this stuff, right? <laughs> so I go to this dinner, and um, before I go, he gave me a pep talk that was amazing for me because growing up with only white parents you don't get the black talk Mm. you don't get the you need to be strong because you know things out there are against you and there's nothing to do about it yeah so he gave me that talk and said hey you're you you are a young black 20 year old female you're going to go to this meeting as a young black 20 year old female and you're going to be you and you're going to act as if I know you can and I think you're going to do great he's like it's going to be a little bit awkward it's going to be what pale stale Male. Whatever. yeah 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 the thing is yeah he said it's going to be that but now I believe you're prepared you're ready Time for you to go. I, I love how he, and that's what coaches and I get men, good mentors do is they see something in us that we don't see in ourselves, right? And he goes, "You're you're ready." Like I had a conversation at Quad A's conference this past past week uh, with a recruiter um, talking about some of the the mentorship that I'm doing now, and I want to pivot to to that in just a second. Um, and I asked her um, what 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 were some of the advice that she got, and very similarly. Um, one of her mentors, which was a male, told her, I know what I've taught you. I've, I've seen the things that you've shown um, learning this business. And even though you don't think you can do this, I know you can do this. So go out there and do it. And it's, it was just kind of like that kick in the pants that she said she needed because of all the things that you talked about. Um, and I think it's so key because regardless of um, ethnicity, being a female in this industry is just really hard. A really great point that was brought up in our conversation was what you should do when you first come into this industry. Should you start your own or should you work for somebody? Um, and I want you to see what she said here. Not just in the financial services industry, but just entrepreneurs in general. I see a lot of entrepreneurs that go out before they're ready. And I don't necessarily mean financially ready. Of course, you want to have the finances. Yeah. That helps. <laughs> yeah, that helps a lot. But you see a lot of people that go out prematurely and they start businesses and they don't really know what they're talking about and they just haven't quite figured it out yet. And they will, they'll figure it out eventually. Yeah. <laughs> they will, yeah. the hard way or the easy way. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I just don't believe that everybody needs to jump out there and be an entrepreneur from jump or sometimes even period. You know, I feel like there's this really, really big wave of like you've got to be an entrepreneur if you're if you're building somebody else's dream and you're not building your own and that's not the case at all yeah so let's unpack that a little bit because yeah you um you open up that pandora's box and i want to i want to i want to continue there because 
candidly speaking, when I started my business three years ago, I had been in the industry 16, 17 years at that point, right? Um, in various capacities. Um, and even um, at that level of expertise and experience, um, it was still hard building my book to where it is now. Like, so like now people look at me, oh, you have a six figure business. Okay, well, yeah, it wasn't that easy to build though. Like even with the experience I have. And I think it's to the point that you just said, <laughs> you can be the greatest financial planner in the world, but if you cannot get in front, in front of somebody and, and explain your unique value proposition selling, then you can hang it up. It's, it's over, it's church for you. And so I think you bring up an excellent point on how if you want to go out on your own, it's not the skill set of just being a good financial planner. There's all these other things like marketing, like running your running your business, growing your business, defining how big you want that thing to get. So um, I don't know what 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 are your what are, what's your take on that? Seems like you agree. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. Um, I feel like a lot of times we we get into this thing where we're like, oh, um, you know if we're building somebody else's dream then we're not building our own that's not that's not the case at all like i'm working on plenty of things right now that are building the dream that i have we all know that no man or woman for that fact is an island in this industry especially finance and i was curious on what steps did jacqueline take to get so successful and you'd probably be surprised at uh, what her number one thing was check this out it's always just been about goals um, I put it like this to a friend because I felt stuck at a certain point. Um, for me, it's always been goals. I wanted to graduate from college with honors. So I did that, achieved that goal. I went the old school route, which is um, going to another school to get your certified financial planner designation. So then after college, I did that. I was like, hey, I'm going to set this goal. I'm going to finish it in X amount of months and I'm going to pass it on the first try and, you know, did all of that. So at that point I was like, all right, school is over. And that's kind of what kept me going at a certain pace. And then I was like, well, now what? Mm. So you just kind of have to eat your head down, head down, head down, trying to do all of your work. Right. And trying to get all of these accolades. And then once you've gotten where you want to go, now you've got to pick your head up and you're, you're pivoting and you're trying to figure out what the next move is. Right. And so for me, it was about figuring out what was going to be best for my career in the long run. Mm. So was it better for me to be around other planners and to be learning from them and their experiences, or was it better for me to just go out on my own and, you know, try to avenge for myself. So for me, um, I did a little bit of both. I worked a lot with solo planners uh, where you're in a very, very independent environment. Um, and then I've also worked at other firms with multiple planners. Um, I'm currently at a firm where we have uh, seven CFPs. Okay. Well, there's a lot of brain power here. And there's a lot to be learned. Jacqueline was so gracious to entertain my rapid fire round. And this is what we uh, end up coming up with in the rapid fire round. Okay. Here's the first phrase. What comes to mind when I say financial literacy? Mm, understanding how money works. Being okay. a student of money and learning how to be a good steward of money. Being a student of money and learning how to be a good steward. That's what you said. Okay. I love that. I love that. I agree that financial education, financial literacy is the only path to economic empowerment. Like, I don't, I don't know that there's another genuine path because we see things like lottery winners or football players or athletes uh, mm -hmm. blow millions of dollars. And it's usually because they're not financially literate. So I totally agree with that. Um, woman advisor. Strong leader. Love it. I love it. My, our industry needs them. Um, I don't know who it was exactly, but there was a pretty prominent guy who said, you know, women make better planners. I won't disagree with this. I don't disagree with this at all. I, I like, look, I've been, I'm, I've been married for 22 years and there's a level of 
EQ that I will never develop. Now, there are some guys, I'm not going to bash all guys. Uh, I'm not going to throw you under the bus, guys, because I, I got tire tracks on my back myself. But what I'm saying is, like, there's a level of natural EQ that a woman brings to a conversation that a guy can never replicate. And they don't have to, like, they don't have to study it. It just, like, comes natural. Like, it, it's really unfair. So I think that is a skill more and more that this industry is needing. Like, I mean, I talk, I listened to a podcast the other day, as I digress a little bit, about the level of automation and digitization coming to this industry over the next 15 years. And a lot of advisors that haven't um, w woken up are going to be, you know, really bluntly surprised in probably the next seven years. And I think what the value proposition becomes to a person consuming financial services is going to be, I need somebody that can kind of coach me through these phases in my life. And I know that these phases in my life is going to involve money. That's kind of the conversation, right? It's not necessarily portfolio rebalancing or asset allocation or money collar theory or any of that kind of crap. It's, it's really, how can I use the relationship I have with Jacqueline or with Dominique to get me to my next phase in life and navigate these curves and whatnot. So that was my pedestal moment for just a second. Um, being wealthy. What comes to mind? What comes to mind? Yeah. Being wealthy. Yeah, yeah. Ultimate freedom. Ultimate freedom. Um, people will think of being wealthy as more than just having money in the bank. It's really about having options. Um, and, and being able to take care of things that they need to be taken care of. You stole the words out of my mouth. Uh, I think Oprah was interviewing Chris Rock a long time ago and he, and she asked him the same question. She was like, what is it like to be wealthy or what do you, what's your definition of being wealthy? And he said, having options. I, I totally agree with that. Uh, where do you see financial services in the next 10 years? Um, that's a really good question. I definitely think that the financial services industry has a long way to go. Um, we have a lot to prove. We have a lot to prove about our capabilities, um, what we can actually do for people, um, that we can be trusted, that we are not all crooks. Um, and then specifically African Americans, you know, we still have some work to do. What do you think is the quickest path to that? I know it's not easy work, um, but what do you think the quickest path to, to that? Because yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I think, I think um, a phrase that I use is that this industry has extracted more in rents than it's given in value um, over the years. And that's, that's not good. Um, and people like us are, are changing that, obviously. But what do you think is the quickest path to, to building that trust with the public? Building trust with the public? Yeah. That's a really good question. I haven't thought about that one entirely. But I think that in order for financial advisors to build trust with the public, we've got to do things that show that we're trustworthy. We have got to really put some more laws into place that really, really help to define what a financial advisor really is, what credentials they need. We need to become a reputable industry. You know, if you become a lawyer, you need to pass the Georgia bar and you, you know, need to have gone to school and do all this. Most, like anybody can call themselves a financial advisor or a financial expert. And the bar is too low. I agree. The bar is way too low. Yeah. Yeah. When I was in college, I was, you know, I was telling my boyfriend at the time, Hey, I'm going to do the CFP after I graduate. Well, he's like, why are you even trying to get your bachelor's degree? Can't you just take that exam and just skip your bachelor's degree? And I was like, no, you can't do that anymore. Thank goodness. Yeah. We, in order for us to become a reputable industry and for, the in, and for the public to trust us, there has to be some steps in place that advisors have to take to call themselves advisors. 
No, well said. I agree. I mean, there's somewhere, you know, I think Cerulea's and Associates has something like 300,000 financial advisors, probably more than that with people that use that title, but there's only 85,000 CFPs, right? So not to say that CFP is the only, uh, we're both CFPs, full disclosure, but um, there are a few credentialed um, other professionals out there that are trustworthy um, specifically around the fi uh, finance. And I'm thinking, you know, specifically like CFAs, right? So um, I think, I think, I think I agree with you. I think the bar is too low for the amount of value and not just value, but impact that we can have on somebody's life trajectory. So with that should be, to be honest, a whole heap of stuff you have to do in order to, excuse me, in order to enter the industry. Uh, you shouldn't just be able to take, as it, is, as it stands right now, a 65 and then open your RIA. You, sh you shouldn't be able to do that. So as you can see, I had a really great conversation with Jacqueline. If you want to hear the entire interview, that's over on my website. I'll link that down um, in the notes for you to peruse. And make sure you follow her on Instagram, Jacqueline Plans, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.